I wanted to just um, start by saying this is exactly what we really wanted here, a conversation. We've been trying to make this about a conversation since we, um, since we launched PFD, but also since we particularly started to talk about these principles for behaving, working, um, dealing responsibly um, in developing countries. Um, before I go any further, I wondered how many people in this room had read the um, various blogs that we had published um, about the principles, just to get a sense of where the audience are, where you are with these, um, these issues, how familiar they are. I was kind of hoping it would be most people, but, um, <laughs> but you'll be forgiven um, um, if you haven't. As long as you go back, read them later and click lots of times, they get lots of hits, so it looks really good. Um, so I wanted to say a bit about why we've um, introduced the principles um, and what we want to achieve by them. Um, what's really important for INAS is that um, what we do, the way we work with our partners, um, what they're trying to achieve um, is sustainable. So here we're talking about um, securing access to research, research literature, journals, e-books, managing that. Managing it so it's accessible now, but also so it's accessible in the future. And that's really critical for us. Um, we've heard a lot this morning, uh, John Kirkland gave a, a brilliant um, overview of some of the um, changes that we've seen uh, in the research and higher education environments in uh, particularly Africa um, and South Asia in the last few years. Um, I was at the, um, the African Higher Education Summit in Senegal in March and there was a real sense of um, a conversation happening then which wouldn't have been possible ten years ago. Things have really leapt on in the last decade. Um, and as, um, as Jonathan said, it's very easy to get swept up in that and to almost be kind of over ambitious about what is possible and where we are now. Um, so I think we all know research and higher education, scholarly communications, changing very quickly. That goes without saying. Um, I think we're all in this room as well because we also believe that research and higher education have an important and a vital role to play in development. And that's the particular space and conversation we want to hold today. Um, what we really want to do is to um, find approaches, find solutions which enable our partners to, um, to gain access, secure access, but work in ways which fits their needs and fits their context. Um, and it's tempting to think, well, that means that uh, here's this kind of global system and they have to find a way to fit within that, um, make sure they can modify all, all of their processes and systems and structures to fit. And obviously some modification, some adaptation is needed. <coughs> but I really believe that if we want a global research system, we have to adapt that system to be inclusive and to respond to their needs as well. We can't just say these are the kind of northern um, systems we have. We have to listen and learn and um, really adapt what we do um, and how we do it. So what we've, we've heard a lot about what's going well, what's um, improving, what's developing. We've also had some, some, some hints about the kind of unmet needs, the, the uh, um, exponential growth, but funding not really keeping pace with that. Um, and anyone who reads um, the kind of fairly specialist uh, higher education research development sort of news around this will be fairly familiar. Anyone who's travelled um, to many of our partner countries will we'll kind of see that um, um, there are many shiny new buildings, very many glass and metal structures going up, university campuses sometimes looking um, quite impressive, but that I've also seen, I, I hope, but there are, there are plenty of um, lecture theatres that are uh, cramped, vastly in need of um, upgrading, uh, facilities and laboratories um, need investment still, lots of researchers who are still waiting to get their PhD so they can progress and become the next generation of academics and of mentors um, that um, many of our partner countries really need. So there's a keeping in balance those, those kind of two worlds is one of our, um, one of our challenges here. But we, but we know you're here because you want to support this too and it's, it's important to you as publishers that the content that you publish gets out into that world, gets to Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, um, Bangladesh, um, Pakistan, wherever it may be. 
Um, but we also know that the reason you're interested in this conversation is because you, you care more than just about it getting out. You care about the role that that information can play and should play in development, um, in enabling research that can uh, solve problems, um, shed new light on complex issues, and enable countries to, um, to use knowledge, use evidence in the best way that they can to solve many of those local challenges, but also regional, even global challenges, to take their place in those global conversations as much as anything. So the principles um, do a few things. They, they kind of gather what we have learnt um, from our many years um, as in ASP, um, working with our partners in um, more than 20 countries. They aggregate a lot of what our partners tell us um, in day-to-day -day conversations, some of the things which you've heard here today, and they aggregate what we've learnt from working with you and a lot of um, good practice. So this is not about um, setting up an opposition. This is about saying there's a lot of good things happening here. A lot of publishers, um, we've heard some examples already, um, really are grappling with these how to balance the commercial and the responsible, um, as Jonathan put it, that, that kind of partnership approach. So we launched these principles last year at the um, Research for Life general meeting uh, in Washington. Um, we had a, um, a session in last year's PFD meeting to um, invite some feedback, invite some comments. Um, and we've had them on the blog and we've invited um, feedback from our partners and the publishers uh, here in this room and, and through wider networks. There was, a, there was a real sense, I think anyway, that there was nothing here which was controversial. Everybody was in broad agreement here that these were good principles, they were the right thing to do. Um, the tricky thing was how to go from principles to day-to-day -day practice. And that's what we want to try and do in the next session. That's what we've got you all in, um, all in groups, uh, questions to answer, to kind of thrash out how you go from the principles into actual practice and what we have to do to overcome some of the impediments and the obstacles which will enable us to realise that ambition. So these are the five principles. Um, I'm going to glance at my, see how long I've got. Um, ten minutes? A bit more. A bit more, okay. Um, these are the five principles which you've, um, you'd have all hopefully seen at some point um, and hopefully also read a bit more deeply on the blogs about what we mean by these and um, some of those country stories and examples which start to bring them to life. We've talked a lot today already about number one. So we've, we've heard about the big differences between um, major research intensive universities and um, rural universities or even within a capital city you may have a university which has fantastic bandwidth and one which is really struggling. So there's that real um, diversity of institutional environments. Um, and there is the countries we work with, um, there's been a huge investment say in the um, fiber optic networks which have linked up um, many African countries to European um, high-speed broadband networks. But a country like Malawi, which is still yet to raise the capital it needs to join that club, is paying something like um, $4,000 um, for a megabit per second every month. If it could join that club it would go down to something like $450 a month. So you can see that as that it's very hard to generalise here, and we, I want to try and avoid doing that by, by us trying to bring out in this conversation and in some of our other work some of those country um, examples, constraints, um, and challenges. Our second principle was, um, it's also been talked about quite a bit today, so respecting a country's wish to negotiate as a purchasing consortium or um, a purchasing club. Um, and um, I think sometimes the kind of language here gets, gets a bit kind of confusing. So what do we mean by a consortium? Um, there are lots of different forms. There are consortia which are kind of embedded in a government agency somehow in a, in a higher education commission and they'll call themselves um, a consortium or there is a consortium which is much more of a, a kind of grassroots, if you like, network which has grown up by membership, um, building a membership base individual institutions coming together and saying, let's solve this problem collectively. Um, so 
if you're not sure what we mean by a consortium or what that, what that consortium or equivalent might be in a country, ask us and we'll help you figure that out um, as best as we can. And probably by putting you in touch with our partners, you can answer that much better. There's, there's lots of advantages here to working in this um, consortium way. And I think as um, you've recognised already, there are advantages both to the publishers and to the countries concerned. So there's much greater visibility for what you're publishing. Um, all that support the consortium can um, provide and muscle it can lend in um, visibility, awareness raising, uh, troubleshooting. There's a, um, a continuity which, is, which may not be there in some countries as government changes um, and priorities shift and budgets are renegotiated. So there's something here which is really important which is about long-term relationships and I think um, Sophia um, and Joel both emphasise that. They want to build a long-term relationship here. There's also something important which touches on some of the conversation we had earlier on about the, the types of institution. Um, in many countries, the kind of active research population is actually quite scattered. It's, it's not just in one or two major institutions. There may be pockets of um, research strength and research expertise or research ambition scattered all across the country. And the consortium is a fantastic way of bringing that together and making sure um, those smaller pockets aren't disenfranchised because they, they don't have the financial might to, uh, to purchase that full breadth of material which they um, would otherwise need to do uh, in, independently. But it also, um, when things are working well, means a lot less noise reaches you as, as a publisher because the consortia are absorbing all sorts of um, work here, access, um, training, troubleshooting, figuring out IP addresses, travelling around the institutions, helping to train individual librarians or... Um, or IT staff. The third principle was to avoid making sudden changes. <coughs> so on our, um, one of our recent blog posts, we, we try to illustrate this by um, the story of um, traffic jams. So anybody who's visited a growing capital city will have spent uh, a large proportion of that time stuck in traffic. Um, and that's frustrating when you're there for a few days or, or a week. Um, but you can kind of deal with it. Um, but if that's your everyday experience, if you're trying to get things done, get to work, get to meetings, you can imagine how quickly that, that starts to erode the time available to move things forward. Um, power shortages, power outages, load shedding, these are really familiar terms if you, if you live in Accra or Nairobi or uh, um, Kampala or Dhaka. Um, not things we have to contend with. And obviously, the power goes down. It probably means the internet goes down too. So there's your, just if you've got these um, expansive networks for communicating and sharing information, they're also fragile as well because of those um, vulnerabilities. So we'd really implore you and our partners would to, to just give plenty of notice. Uh, if you're anticipating change, let them know as soon as you can and start that, that that conversation, because the sooner it, it, it's opened, the sooner it happens, the sooner uh, consortia and their member institutions can start to figure out what they need to do in order to respond and to keep this access and keep research, because that's the end result, keep research flowing so there aren't breaks in that um, uh, flourishing research environment um, and research community. So our fourth principle, um, about th this year we moved more into the uh, um, pricing. So we've deliberately um, left the pricing till last because I think the conversation often gets stuck on the money. And there's much more uh, than just the money we, we want to talk about here. But obviously prices matter. Prices is, is the real point where things start to come together, get hot, get a bit worrying. Um, so we'd urge you to think medium to long term here pricing and think about um, what kind of relationship you want um, the consortia and the publisher coming together and thinking about a relationship over several years and thinking about pricing in those terms. So investments going up, we've, um, Jonathan mentioned the World Bank investing, um, there's a network of centres of excellence um, in Africa, there are various investments in South Asia. It's, it's really great that we are seeing that, that uh, 
new funding. It's got a backlog of an awful lot of things that it's needed for. It's not going to be coming straight um, into the libraries. What it does mean is that there is more chance of research and higher education prospering um, when access is available, but that access has to be funded somehow. And um, I think most of our colleagues here um, from the library side would, would, um, would, would say straight away, library budgets are often at the back of the queue, even if they feature in the queue at all. So um, it's, it's balancing that optimism and that um, sense of investment with, with the day-to-day -day realities of budgets are, um, may not even be going up year on year. They might even be decreasing year on year. Um, a, very, a very small um, increase in a dollar or a sterling amount is probably magnified when you think you're dealing in Malawi and Kwacha or Kenyan shilling or um, um, uh, I think in Bangladesh it's the taka, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, so those, those things are really magnified. Um, we, we do take a real world view here though. We do understand that um, where relationships are shifting towards direct um, relationships between a publisher and a country, um, that involves more work on publisher side too. You've got to involve, uh, involve yourself in negotiations, in licensing. Um, there are um, the administrative uh, demands of um, invoicing, managing payments, um, providing any documentation needed so that uh, countries don't have to go and get three different tenders when there's only one, one um, supply of that particular package. Um, queries that you might get more of directly troubleshooting, IT issues, access issues. So we, we understand that there's a, um, a change here, but those consortia budgets aren't increasing at the same time as that change is happening. Rising prices can be really hard to accommodate as a result. And I think, um, I think it was Patrick in Malawi who put this um, really well when he wrote back to us and um, we featured one of his uh, comments in one of the blogs. Um, African libraries, Malawian libraries, are really in a fix because um, they can see no sign that uh, those costs are going to reduce, but they also can't see any sign how they're going to increase their budgets either. So I kind of want to end here by just emphasizing this, this important time we're at. We're, we're at a point in time where after many years of underinvestment and underfunding, research and higher education are really starting to flourish. And we really want to um, enable that by providing and ensuring access and not stifle it as it's just getting going again. And as those constituencies are making the case for their national investment, they need to be able to show how they're contributing to their countries. And uh, if access starts to drop, that's going to stifle that um, research, research activity, emerging research cultures, and make it harder to show what they are contributing to their country's national um, development and, then, and the national needs. And that's a much longer conversation. And you can lose that very easily, but it takes a long time to win it back. I think I'm probably up to time there, OK? But I'd like to end just by saying thank you to, to all of you for wanting to be part of this, and also to our various partners around the world who've, who've really engaged. And they aren't, they aren't here now, but they've um, sent their comments in and really brought these principles to life. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, John. I think it's really helpful. Oh.